It's one minute past 10. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, we're going to chat about wills. As you know, um, September is wills month, and um, it is important to have a will. And today's discussion is not a academic lecture. It is um, information that I've gathered from experience over the years doing wills. Um, so let's start with the presentation. All right, Wills, what can go wrong? Um, let me introduce myself first quickly. I'm Jan Jordan. I'm the director of Jan L. Jordan Incorporated. I've been practicing for my own account since 1993. I specialize in conveyancing, the administration of wills and the drafting, uh, the administration of the seized estates and the drafting of wills. Um, we're going to discuss a few things today, drafting tips, uh, formalities of wills, details and wills uh, that you know, we'll discuss that later, and do's and don'ts, and how we can assist you. Let's start with drafting tips. When, when you prepare a will, or if your will is, is being prepared by somebody, make sure that it's easy to understand uh, English. I say English, it's obviously any language it could be, but it must be plain and simple English. All right. Um, remember, the person who passed on or the person who's made the, the will, the testator, is not around uh, after his death to explain what he's actually had in mind. Um, so when you do your will, or if it gets drafted by somebody, make sure that um, you should actually go to a third party and say, please read my will and explain to me what you understand from it. Um, I've had it in the past where people, uh, where a will has been drawn up by somebody um, and, and uh, you need the testator actually to explain what the purpose of the, uh, the details in the will was. Avoid legal jargon. I've seen wills that's 10, 20 pages long and Three quarters of it is just legal jargon and doesn't help anybody, doesn't add anything to, to make the will valid, etc. If you refer to trust or companies as beneficiaries in your will, always make sure that it's actually registered. I've had it before where a person say, um, my trust ABC must inherit it. Um, and then the trust has never been registered. So it's important to make sure that those things are registered. If you refer to a trust or a company as your beneficiary, always insert the company registration number or the trust registration number. Um, it makes it so much easier and, and there can't be any um, misunderstanding of who the company or the trust should be. Spelling errors. If you do have a will after this presentation, go and check your will for spelling errors. Now have a look at my, my example that I've got on the screen here. What has happened in the past? Person has said, I leave my house contents and my house to ABC. Compare that to I leave my house contents or my house um, to ABC. Just one spelling error. Instead of the and, they made it or. Um, you can only imagine the consequences of that. Okay. So go and read and, and, and make sure that there aren't any spelling errors. Always make sure that there's a beneficiaries that will inherit the residue or the balance of your estate. I, yesterday I had a client in my office doing her will. She said to me, she's only got a car in the house. Um, she didn't, couldn't really understand that there would be a residue or a balance. Yeah, sure, today when we draw up the will, there might not be a residue or a balance. But by the time you die, there might be a, a residue or a balance. Um, so it's always important to have that in your will. Um, who should inherit the residue or the balance of your estate? Formalities. Um, we're going to look at the, the act. But before we get to that, let's do a poll question quickly, just for interest sake. Read the question. A will consists of five pages. The testator signed every page. However, the two witnesses only signed on the last page. Is the will valid? So if you think it's valid, click a one. If you think it's not valid, then tick two. Um, 
Okay, about 22 people have voted already. 25, 27 people have voted. Let's leave it at that. Um, 23 people reckon it's valid and 77 people think that it's uh, not valid. Uh, just wanna get out here. Okay. The answer is that the will, the will is indeed valid, all right? The act states that the testator must sign every page of his will. The witnesses only have to sign the last page of the will to make it valid, okay? But it is a good practice to make sure that your, your um, witnesses sign every page. Then you don't have issues with that. All right. Um, to comply with the Wills Act, um, as I mentioned, the testator must sign at the end. If there are more than one page, you must sign every page. Um, in the presence of two or more competent witnesses. Now, people, we're going to uh, discuss this point quickly. When you sign your will, two witnesses have to be present. You can't have it, sign it, walk over to your neighbor on the left-hand side and say, sign as witness, and then walk over the road to your other witness, uh, to your other neighbor and ask him to sign it as witness. That will, will be, uh, won't be valid. The two witnesses must be present at the time when you sign and then they sign the will. All right, the witnesses only need to sign on the last page. However, as I mentioned before, it is good practice to get them to sign on every page. All right. If the person that's making the will um, is not in a position to sign it um, and, and, and it's for whatever reason can't sign it um, and can only make a cross or a fingerprint, then a commissioner of oaths has to be present and he has to then certify that the person who's made the will is uh, compass mentis and um, that it is his last will. Very important, that last point on this page is make sure that your will is dated. The reason why it's so important to have your will, that your will is dated, if you have more than one will that you've drawn up over the years and you pass on, how will anybody know which will was the last will that you um, entered into or, or signed? And let's say, um, okay, you've got dates on, you've got uh, your old will, then the latest dated one will then be your last will that um, your estate, in terms of which your estate will be wound up. All right. Details in the will. We need to discuss this point as well. I often get it where clients, clients think that assets that's in a trust is their personal assets. I can't stress it enough that assets that's in a, in a trust is not your asset. Whoever is the trustee of a, of a trust only manages that trust, the benefit of the, the assets in that trust. When you drop your will, you can't refer to assets that's in that trust because it's not yours. It's a different entity. You might happen to be the trustee of that trust, but it's not your assets. Okay, so get that right when you prepare your will. Um, so in other words, you cannot state what should happen to assets that's not yours. Okay, spell your beneficiaries' names correctly. You know, I'm always saying, especially in the Afrikaner community, we, we, we like our family names, like Gert, Johannes, Albertus. Um, if there are a few of your, the, the typical Gert, Johannes, Albertus is in your family, then specify who you're referring to. Say, my son, Gert, Johannes, Albertus, or my brother, or my father, whoever it is. Very important, those small things um, that could make a big difference if you don't do it properly. Um, remember, a will to be valid has to be in writing. Okay. There, in terms of Section 2.3 of the Wills Act, 
the court can declare a will valid if it doesn't comply with all the rules and regu regulations. But why go through all of that if you can do it properly from the word go? A few years ago, um, I had an estate that I had to administer. Um, the client prepared the will and he got what, one witness to sign. Needless to say, that will was not valid. So we had to apply to court to have the will declared valid, which wasn't a problem. Nobody opposed it. Um, and the court granted the order, no problem. But it cost us, and that was a few years ago, it cost us 10,000, the estate trial, the 10,000 rand to, to the, to, for the court to declare that will valid. I mean, exactly, you know, why, why waste all of that if you can do it properly when you're alive? Okay. You don't have to give the witnesses uh, details, but I think it's a good practice to do it. When we prepare our wills, we always uh, at the back of the will, we state who the witnesses are. We even put in the, the uh, ID number and if there's any relationship with the testator. Very important point, assets to minors, trust after death. People, when, when an, a, um, a minor inherits from you, by law, if that child is younger than 18, anything that that child inherits in terms of money has to be paid to the guardian fund. The guardian fund, and I'm going to say this slowly and, and clearly, guardian fund is a government department controlled by the master of the high court. That's the last thing that you want. So if you know that there might be minors, people, children under the age of 18 that might inherit from you, then rather make provision in your will that a trust must be formed after death. In your will, you will then nominate who the trustees must be to control the money of the minor children. Also specify in your will at what age should the money then be paid to the children. You don't have to limit it to 18. I like the age of 25. Um, but think for yourself, if you would have received, if you had received lots of money um, uh, at the age of 18, I mean, we all would have spent it. So I like 25. Um, but it's obviously up to the testator to make that choice. Um, nominate your trustees and then also specify who, when the trust must be terminated. A good a guideline is also to have at least two trustees. Um, you have, may have more, but it's not always practical to just have one. All right. We are sitting with an estate that we are dealing with where the testator said that in his will that his two sons must inherit everything that he has or had. Um, those two boys are fighting like you won't believe. In fact, they hate each other. It makes it just about impossible to wind up the estate. So if you know that your, your heirs aren't getting along, um, then rather state who should inherit what. Right. Johnny must get um, cash and, and Sarah must get the house, something like that. Um, but if you know they, they, they've got a good relationship, it's not a problem to say that they must inherit everything for, uh, in equal shares, um, for instance. Nominating your executor and or your trustee is important because the, the act says that the person who's uh, acting as the executor or the trustee has to obtain a bond of security. In simple terms, that executor has to take out um, a insurance that should he steal the money or pay it out to the wrong person, then the insurance company will stand good for it. However, um, if the executor is a parent, a spouse or a child, you don't have to even specify that the security is waived because by law it's automatically waived. But specify in your will that the, that the, that the security be waived because if you don't do that and we have to get security, the cost of that is 0.5% of the value of your estate. Again, that's just money that you're throwing away. 
Um, so rather put it in, in your will that you waive the security. And the argument's always the people, the person that you nominate as the executor. If you don't trust him enough, uh, then you should not nominate him as the executor. All right. A practical tip, always have a succession clause. Um, I'll read part of it. Um, especially in a joint will, we always say in the event of us dying simultaneously or the survivor dying without leaving a further valid will, the survivor is hereby bequeathed his or his state as follows. Um, the reason why it's so important to have a succession clause is, you know, if your spouse pass on, it is traumatic. Um, it takes a, a few weeks, if not months, before you really come to terms and, and then uh, have a new will drawn up. But if you've got a clause in like this, uh, and you don't get around to do a new will, then your existing will will be in place and it will be valid. And if you pass on, uh, your assets will go to the people as per the will. Okay. Protect your heirs if they are married in community of property. If you don't have a protection clause in and your heir is married in community of property, whatever he or she inherits, half of that, will automatically be their spouse's uh, uh, property as well. Um, you don't want that. You need to protect your heirs. So we always put a clause in, all bequests uh, and any income there from deriv uh, derived from time to time in terms of this will shall be excluded from any legal consequences of a marriage. Right, very important to have it in any standard will. The last one is, um, is also good to have in, it's a collation condition. So that's, uh, I think if we read it, it will, it's self-explanatory. Um, it will explain itself. It's a specific condition of this will that any benefit which may accrue to any beneficiary during our lifetime will not be taken into consideration in terms of any inheritance derived from our state. So in other words, when you pass on whatever you have left that will be then equally distributed amongst your uh, heirs. People, before we carry on, I've uh, neglected to say, if you do have any questions, in the chat box, ask the questions. At the end of the presentation, Shalosh uh, Packery, she's a, an attorney and the head of our deceased estate department, will then answer all those questions in the chat box. And after that, we will open the floor for any questions um, that you want to do verbally. All right, let's carry on. Next slide. It's important that you specify in your will how you marry. It just makes it so much easier when we wind up your estate. Next one is um, agricultural land. It's something that you should know, uh, that you know that agricultural land cannot be registered in the name of two or more people's names without the consent from the local authority. So, yeah, you know, it's a process. The way the local authority is run now, it takes forever to get that consent. But just keep that in mind when you prepare or draft your will. Here's a very interesting, not a lot of uh, section act, not a lot of people know this. Uh, if a testator dies within three months of a divorce, he, and he executed the will before he got divorced, and he nominated his now ex-wife or ex-spouse rather as a beneficiary, then the will will be implemented as if the ex-spouse had died before the date of the divorce. Interesting that. So unless it's, unless it's clear from the will that the testator intended to benefit the ex-spouse uh, despite the divorce, uh, she will be able to inherit. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if there's a divorce, uh, make sure that you amend your will or um, make it clear that you want your ex-spouse to inherit from you as well. Let's do a poll question again. Is a beneficiary who signs as a witness entitled to inherit? If you think he is entitled or she is entitled, then say yes. If you don't think they're entitled, then it's no. All right, I see at this stage is about 38, 39% people think that it, um, the, the, the beneficiary is entitled to inherit. 
Um, now it's changed to 40, 60%. Let me explain. Um, let me explain quickly. When you sign as a witness, you can only inherit as much as you would have inherited if the deceased had no will. In other words, the deceased passed on, he's got no will, the Interstate Act kicks in, and in terms of the Interstate Act, it is decided who gets what. Now, let me use an example. If you are married and you've got two kids, children, and you don't have a will, and you pass on, your spouse and two children will inherit an equal shares. All right? So one-third each. But if one of those is signed a will or as a witness, he can only inherit as much as he would have inherited if the deceased or the, the, you know, the, the state had died without a will. So if there's a will and I sign as a, as a, as a witness, and in terms of the will, I can inherit 50% of the inheritance, then I will be disqualified and I will only be able um, to inherit one third of the estate, of the inheritance. Okay, I hope that's clear. If it's not, ask, ask your questions in the chat box and we'll chat about it at the end. Witnesses, the role of a witness is to witness the signature of the testator. Remember what I said in the beginning, uh, you can't sign it, then take it to Johnny and then to Sarah. Uh, they have to be present, very important. So in general, when we advise clients, we say to clients, um, make sure that your witness is an independent person, a person that's not mentioned in your will. Um, because that person could be disqualified. All right, rather get two, two independent witnesses. It makes it simple. When people sign their wills here at our office, we get two staff members and, and there's never an issue about that. Okay. In your will, you have to nominate an executor or trustees if there's a trust. Um, the executor has to be, must be chosen very wisely. Think carefully about your, about your executor. Um, to wind up an estate is a specialized field, no doubt, all right? It must be somebody that you trust. Um, because remember, your executor takes full control of your estate and he or she has to have to wind it up, distribute it as per your will. Make sure the person that you nominate, somebody that you really can trust. It's also a good thing to, to whoever you nominated as the executor to chat to him and ask him if he's prepared to do that. Um, because if he's not, then it's important that you change your will. Or let's say the person passed on, change your will. It's very important. Um, I've seen this. Um, unborn beneficiaries, uh, we, we often get it where a grandmother or grandfather would say, I want all my grandchildren to inherit. Great idea. But the practical side of that is we won't be able to wind up your estate or finalize the estate until such time as your children physically can't have more children. Think about it. If your children can still have children, then we will have to wait until they have more children. So it's better to say um, that, that my grandchildren that are alive at the time of my death must inherit from me. All right, just a practical tip there. Know the difference between an heir and a legatee. A legatee is a person that inherits specific sums of money or assets, where an heir inherits the balance. Now, the practical side of this is that we have to pay from an estate, winding up the estate, we have to pay all the costs and um, debts, all of that, as well as the legatees. And then what is left will be paid to the heirs. So I have to use an example to explain. If your estate is worth a million rand, and you say, no, let, let's say when you do your will, your estate, your, at that stage, your estate is worth a million rand, and you say, 
a little Johnny must inherit 500,000 from you. And the balance must go to your spouse, arguments. At the time of your death, your estate is worth only 600,000. Then Johnny is going to get 500 and your heir is going to get 100. Let's take it further. Same scenario. At the time of your death, your estate is worth only 400,000. Then Johnny is going to inherit the full 400,000 um, and your heir is not going to inherit the cent. Make sure that you understand the difference. Okay. Um, let's just check a codicil. A codicil is like a, a denim to a will in simple terms. Um, the same rules apply. It has to be signed by the uh, testator as well as two independent witnesses. It doesn't have to be the same witnesses um, that signed your original will. And um, it has to be dated as well. But this is my advice. If you do want to do a codicil, rather redo your will. Um, okay. Because if you pass on and a beneficiary picks up your will, and he goes through it and he sees that the codicil is actually not to his benefit. He can easily tear up the, the, the codicil and present the um, original will to the master and nobody will be wiser. Um, you know, when we do our wills, the will is uh, saved on our computer. Um, and and when you, if you want to change it, it's a simple exercise. You come in, you tell us what you want to change. We change it, we print it, you sign it and off you go. So that's my advice. I'm not very much in favor of a codicil. All right. Next slide. Amendment of uh, a will. Amendment means that you on the will, you physically amend something. Let's say you want to take little Johnny's name out. You draw a line through him um, and um, then Johnny won't inherit from you. That's fine. You can do it. But to make it valid, you need to use the test data, need to sign next to it as well as two independent witnesses. Again, not doesn't have to be the same witnesses that signed your original will. Um, and you have to date it. Right, so it's important if you make amendments. Again, why go through that if you can just do your will properly again? Just contact us and we will assist you. Very important people, that last sentence on, on the page, always revoke your previous will. So a standard will should always start off with, I hereby revoke and cancel my previous wills. Okay. Um, then, then you don't end up with 10 wills and we have to use all 10 and, and make it work. If you cancel the previous will, it's cancelled. Okay. Questions I often get where clients ask me um, if, let's say, they had a will with the bank, uh, should they now, once they've signed a new will, should they now go to the bank and physically cancel it? It's not necessary. Um, your will states, if your will states, I hereby revoke and cancel my previous wills, that previous will is cancelled. Right. Hold multiple wills. That's when you have assets in more than one country. Let's take the UK and South Africa. You've got assets in South Africa and you've got assets in the UK. It is practically better to have a will in South Africa for your assets in South Africa and to have a will in the UK for your assets in the UK. If you don't have the two wills, not a problem. It, the only issue is that it's going to take a, a way longer to finalize uh, your estate. But now, if you are in a position where you have uh, assets in two different countries, listen carefully. A will always starts off with, I hereby revoke and cancel all my wills. So you've got a will in, in the UK, you come to South Africa and I drop a will for you. You don't say to me anything, you don't tell me about the, the assets in the UK. I start off and I prepare your will, hereby revoke and cancel all your will, uh, wills. Um, then it means that will in the UK has also been cancelled. So it's important. If you do that, you have to state clearly, this will is for my assets in South Africa. The other, world, uh, the other world must also read, this will is only for my assets in, say, the UK. All right, I hope you understand that difference. Important to update your will on a regular basis. The question is always, what is a regular basis? Um, I think every second year, just have a look at your will, if it is still what you want it to be. Um, you know, update your will when there's an event that happened in your life, like a, a death or... Um, simple thing I always uh, say is if you win the lottery, 
um, then you need to update your will. All right. Um, don'ts, maybe not don'ts as such, but just be aware of it when you pass on. There, there might be things that need to be paid, like you might have a bond, um, there's taxes, you might owe acres, um, there are fees for to administer the, the estate. Um, we have to pay the master's fees. It's anything between uh, 600 Rand and 7,000 Rand. You might have to cancel, the, we might have to cancel the bond. Uh, there might be tax consultants uh, involved, etc. So keep that in mind when you do your will. Because you might say, um, I want my spouse to inherit my house. The house is worth 2 million, but you've got a bond of 1.8 million over the property. Mm, then she's not really going to gain anything by that because we have to settle the bond first, or she will have to settle. Um, but if you want to chat about this point, you're welcome to chat to me afterwards. Now, before we go to the questions and, and answers, this is how we can assist you guys. Um, there are four ways that we can assist you in, in how you how we can pre prepare a will. You can come in and have a personal consultation at our office. We can have a telephone consultation. We could have a Zoom consultation. Or we've designed an, uh, a wills application form that we can email to you. You complete it. Um, you send it back to us. We will then drop your will and then send it to you. Please remember, we draft wills at no charge. Um, people, there's no catch in it. Um, there's, there's absolutely nothing funny in it. If you want to chat to us uh, about it, uh, if you want to make an uh, appointment, you can phone us on 7484500 or send us an email at wills at young L your dog. All right, people, let's, um, let's go and have a look at the um, questions that was asked. Um, Shalosh, are you there? As I said, Shalosh Packery is the head of our deceased estates department. Shalosh is also admitted attorney and uh, she's got lots of uh, many years of experience. Shalosh, do you want to go through the chats or the questions in the chat box? And then, people, after that, we're going to open the floor. If there are anyone that wants to ask questions, uh, you're more than welcome. Shalosh. Absolutely. Thank you, Jan. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending our webinar. Um, our first question comes from Stacy Fenter. Uh, and Stacy asks if um, a joint will or separate will for married couples. So, so really, Stacy, that is the um, it's, that's at the discretion of the testator or testatrix. It's it's really your freedom of testation whether you want to do a joint will or separate will. Let me just briefly set out the differences. So, a joint will means that you are jointly doing a will with another party. It could either be your spouse or another party. Um, and you could in the will bring in clauses to speak to a joint asset or your separate assets. Fundamentally, people who are married uh, like to do a joint will because it's one document and one instrument that they have to look at um, to deliver when something happens to their partner. Um, obviously, the different types of marriages also affects how that estate will be executed. Um, but in simple, question, in simple terms, it is your decision whether you want to do a joint will or, or a, a separate will. The only difference is, is that, or fundamental difference is, is that if you do a joint will, we pro if you're doing a will with us, we bring in a clause that provides for the passing of the survivor or at simultaneous death. Um, and that will, that original will is lodged with the master of the high court. Now, for every new reporting of an estate, an original will is required. Therefore, if you had lodged the only original will, that means to report the second dying estate, you need to get a certified copy of that will for the survivor when the survivor passes on. That is why we always advise our clients to make a, a will as soon as their partner has passed on. Hope that answers your question. Um, the second question Stacy had is when do we need a trust? 
So a trust does not all only um, provide for a minor beneficiary. So the law says that if a beneficiary is under the age of 18 years old, they regard it as a minor. And if you don't make provision for a trust in a will, then their inheritance would be paid over to the master of the high court guardians fund. Um, so definitely in the instance of a minor beneficiary to provide for that minor, Jan touched on that. Um, at 18, you still consider them to be a bit uh, inexperienced and perhaps a bit immature. So your will allows you to set up a trust to provide for them to receive their inheritance potentially at an age of 25 or 21, whatever you deem su suitable. A trust could also be established for an instance where your beneficiary is, for example, uh, for example, disabled, physically challenged, and won't be able to take care of themselves. Uh, in that instance, a trust is created and your trustees, in essence, provide and, and look after the funds that you have left from your estate for the inheritance of that specific and the maintenance needs of that specific beneficiary. Then we've got a question from Michael. Michael asks, if you leave money to a very young minor and a trust is formed, is there not a risk that the tax laws associated with trusts will erode this prior to the money being paid out? So, so definitely, Michael, your trust uh, taxation is at a much higher rate. So to explain to you, an individual's taxation is around 18%. A business entity's taxation is around 38%. And a trust taxation is around 45%. So definitely, the taxation that is levied on a trust entity is much higher. And therefore, one would have to consider what assets are actually left at the in the trust and for what duration, because that would definitely impact the ultimate inheritance received by your beneficiaries. However, remember, if you're establishing a trust for the duration of the period that the trust has been established up until termination of that trust, usually the clauses to bring in that trust is for the maintenance needs of the beneficiary. So the, so the funds available within the trust would provide for the maintenance needs of the beneficiary for that duration. So you won't necessarily have a case where every, all the funds would be eroded and nothing would be paid out. Hope that answers your question, Michael. Then there's a question from Blessing. Blessing asks, uh, good day, if I have two worlds with different banks, which one will be implemented? What happens to the other will? Um, does the other bank get some sort of payment? Very important as well, Jan touched on this. Uh, we as a norm, and I assume those who are qualified in doing wills or drafting wills will insert first and foremost a revocation clause. So it would read, I revoke any previous wills, which means that your later dated will would be your most valid will by which your estate will be administered. So in answer to your question, if you have different wills at different banks, your later valid, your later dated will would be your valid will. And, and the other bank would not necessarily share in any sort of payment or fees as such. Um, Peter Thompson, um, don't, okay, that was just a comment from Peter who said, don't leave your wills with the banks. Now, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, Melanie asks, what are the uh, costs to administer a trust? Um, so, Melanie, one would have to look at various aspects of a trust creation. You'd look at a cost for the establishment of the trust. You'd look at the cost for administ administering the, uh, the trust. Usually it's not, it's, uh, there's a guideline in terms of the Trust Property Control Act, but there's nothing cast in stone. So the guideline is in terms of what the marketplace already has, and it usually ranges between 1 or 1.5%, uh, bordering on 2% of the asset value or the capital available in the trust. That's usually a uh, administration fee that is level, levied on an annual basis for the trust. 
Um, then Devani Naidu asks, um, can you nominate someone at an attorney's office as your executor? If yes, what happens to your will if that company closes? Very important question, Devani. Uh, absolutely, you can nominate somebody at an attorney's office. Remember, we want to reiterate and stress the point that uh, the administration of a, a deceased estate is a legal process, one which the master of the high court is not going to allow any lay person to administer. So at some point, even you, if you're a nominated executor uh, in the capacity as a lay person or friend or family member of the, of the testator, the master may not approve or accept your appointment if you are not duly assisted by a legal person. So uh, definitely a um, executor can be appointed from an attorney's practice. Um, and should that company close, for example, uh, well, that's the importance of selecting an executor. Um, you'd have to look at the history of the uh, uh, company. You'd have to look at the track record of the company. You'd look at and uh, look at the company uh, specializing it, whether they specialize in estates. And most importantly, for example, our company, uh, we, we nominate the company as such. So there is succession. You can continue. So it's not nominating Mr. Yan Yodan in his personal capacity, but we are nominating Yan Yodan Incorporated Attorneys with the understanding that succession will take place. Um, but in a quick answer, what happens if that company closes or your executor dies? Uh, all it means is your will is valid an executor just needs to be replaced. Right, then uh, Valerie. Valerie asks, who is the next best, best person to appoint as executor if you don't want to appoint a family member? I think I've just uh, spoken to that question in my previous response. Uh, so that would definitely be a, a legal professional in my opinion. Um, Blessing wants to know, okay, Blessing is commenting on Peter Thompson's uh, comment about the banks. Um, Peter goes on further, and I hope the two of you are going to hook up afterwards to share those comments amongst yourselves. Um, Rulani wants to know, may you kindly explain the collation condition again? Okay, so in simple terms, uh, the collation clause just speaks to um, what will happen when I pass on? So, for example, the collation says anything that I've given to my beneficiaries during my lifetime will not be taken into account when I pass on. Simple terms. If I have three children and I've given child one 50,000 during my lifetime, I've given child two a motor vehicle and I've given child three a, a townhouse. That collation clause means that when I pass away, I do not want what I've given them during my lifetime to be uh, calculated and then an a, a equal inheritance then distributed to my beneficiaries. What I've given to them, I've done so freely with love and good faith to my benefit or to my family members or my beneficiaries during my lifetime, and I'm not saying deduct it from the inheritance before they inherit. However, on that point, there's also the instance where you could specify in the collation clause that you want a fair and equitable distribution, and you specify that you've given child one, two, three, A, B, and C, and you want it deducted from the inheritance to ensure the fair and equitable distribution at your passing. Okay, then um, Ursula. Ursula asks, my personal experience in the banks handling deceased estates um, is that they are a nightmare, no good or personal service, and they don't care about beneficiaries. Okay, uh, no empathy for beneficiaries, and they also take their time. Not really going to comment with them uh, about that comment, but I am going to state that um, you are speaking to very real and life people who are interacting with you, and that is who we are. Uh, we are available to interact on a personal basis with you. 
Um, question from Matebojo. Um, a case of beneficiaries being minors, can the testator stipulate how much money should be released monthly to the guardian? This is assuming that a trust will be paying the money to the guardian. Absolutely, Matebojo. Um, that is something we bring in the trust clause. And one can be very broad in general, or one can be very specific in your trust clause to provide for the maintenance needs of your beneficiaries. So at any given point, um, you can stipulate exactly what you would like carried out, um, obviously provided that you have sufficient funds to provide for those, those provisions you are making. Uh, in, in the trust clause. Um, I mean, we've paid out quite a bit from the estate. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, was that a question from someone? Yeah. Okay. Um, going on further. Um, mm. oh, wait. <laughs> Um, sorry, I think somebody is not muted. Uh, Jean, if you can just have a look and perhaps mute our attendees. Um, then another question, where beneficiaries have equal shares and not getting along, how are those cases resolved in, also in most disputes or the not getting along between siblings happens after death? Now, I think Jan touched on the scenario that we currently faced with, and we see this on a daily basis where beneficiaries don't get along. And that's why the only advice we can give you once, whilst you are alive is make sure that your will speaks to um, what you specifically want to leave your beneficiaries to avoid any discord after your passing. So at the end of the day, remember if, if it's something that existed prior or whilst you were still alive, it's not something we can potentially um, manage afterwards. But the only way that we can address it is we still maintain the professional uh, stance, the neutral stance, and we obviously our main objective is to ensure that the estate is administered in terms of the last wishes and intentions of the deceased, and we adhere to what the Estates Act says. So we maintain our professionalism and our impartiality when dealing with beneficiaries. Um, then we have a question from Byron. If there's a bond on the property with no life insurance, will the spouse be given the option to take over the bond or will the bank at automatically repossess the house? Um, very important question, Byron. Um, obviously, no property can be uh, transferred without a bond being settled or taken over. So definitely there is an option for the surviving spouse to take over the, the bond. And it's called a uh, substitution of data application that is facilitated by the bank. But remember the, the spouse needs to qualify for that. And that means you have to meet the protocols of the banking institution. So yes, that is definitely an option provided the spouse qualifies for takeover and, and the bank won't necessarily, necessarily repossess. That is why an estate where there is a bond uh, over fixed property needs to be dealt with and attention given to it as soon as possible. So you can address all of these concerns from early on in the process so as to avoid possible attachment by the bank. Remember, ultimately, the bank is the title holder. They do have the sole, uh, uh, they are entitled to attach the property, but uh, it's something we work together with the beneficiaries in, in, in resolving the, uh, the, the uh, situation in the estate and getting to a point of, is it, is it viable to take over a bond? Is it, is it a last option to sell, for example? All of these things are discussed early on in the estate process with the beneficiaries. Um, then I see there is a, another question from Devani who asks, can we also use an attorney's office to manage the trust for our kids. So, so yes, definitely um, an attorney's office who specializes in trusts uh, would be able to manage the trust for your kids. Um, 
that's definitely it's 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 a legal entity and it is an impartial objective entity as well there's a question that asks what happens should the executor trustee die before the will is finalized um i think maybe the question is before the estate is finalized perhaps uh before the uh, because there's two fundamental points the will is something different if an executor dies uh, that you've nominated an executor in your will and the executor dies, you're still alive, you always have the option to change your executor during your lifetime. If the question is, what happens if we're busy with the estate and the executor dies midway, then the answer is that executor would have to be replaced. It is, it is just an administrative function to replace the executor as such. Um, question from Tonya. Hi, I lost, oh, sorry, internet connection. John, that's your line. <laughs> um, the question is, will you be able to send the recording to me? We will address your question in due course. Um, another question, where is the practical and accessible place one can leave their will? So I think uh, Jan may have touched on this also. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, wills like a title deed, uh, a title deed is registered of a for fixed property is a legal document that's registered in the deeds office. And the deeds office is a central place where one can pick up uh, any details of a, a fixed property. Uh, that's that you know uh, registered in an owner's name. Now, unfortunately, there isn't a central storage unit or space or entity for a will. Um, with the freedom of testation, an individual can approach legal practitioners. They can approach banks. They can approach. Uh, they can draft a will themselves. So there's no central storage place. I would say that um, if you are approaching a legal entity, usually they have the facility to uh, keep your will in safekeeping. For example, when we draft wills for our clients, we have two original copies signed, one we give to you for safekeeping and one we keep with, our, uh, with ourselves uh, in safe custody, just, for, just in case something should happen to your copy. Then there's a question from Melanie. Um, Please confirm estimated time frame to wind up an estate in the event of both partners passing away simultaneously. Melanie, it's a very loaded question that you're asking me. Um, every estate differs. Uh, the facts uh, to every estate are different. Um, although the, the Estates Act is, is, uh, sets out the procedure, every estate and every time frame for an estate administration differs. However, we usually say if it's a straightforward matter, the usual time frame is eight months to wind up the estate. Taking bear, or bearing in mind there's various factors to it, there's various stakeholders. Remember, we deal with a lot of third parties. Many of those third parties are government institutions over which we have no control over. But that should give you a rough idea, eight months if you're looking for a generalized uh, indication. Um, Andreas, please mention the RA, please mention that RA is excluded from estate provision as are insurances. Okay, I think you, you're speaking to the fact that yes, uh, when we ascertain what the assets are of a deceased person in an estate, we look at personal assets and personal assets comprise of fixed property, bank accounts, movables and so forth. Um, very important retirement annuities and pension funds do not form part of a deceased estate. They are governed separately by the Pension Funds Act and are administered separate, separately by the trustees of that pension fund. Uh, as with insurance policies, life policies, if there is no nominated beneficiary on those life policies, then yes, it falls into the estate. If there's a nominated beneficiary, it would pay out directly to that beneficiary. 
A question again from Mate Bojo. Are there any fees associated with updating of the will? Uh, and also, what is it in uh, what is in it for you for drafting the will for free? So, so I think uh, you must have noticed, Mate Bojo, that we do draft wills for free. I can't say that the rest of the country does that or every institution does that. Uh, but definitely at Yanyo Down Incorporated Attorneys, we do draft wills for free. Um, there is no catch. There's no hidden cost with the drafting of wills. That is what it is. Uh, however, the costs come in with the administration of the estate as stipulated in legislation. So that is when costs actually kick in. Um, a question from Rina. Uh, while alive, you verbally distribute items, either of jewelry, monies, and not specified in will. Witnesses to the verbal, can the person still claim the items in terms of the last wishes? So, Rina, in simple, uh, a simple response to that question would be, at the time of your passing, we establish what the assets are as a date of death. If you had distributed assets prior to date of death, then they do not exist in essence at your passing and we cannot deal with it. So you've given it during your lifetime, it's not taken into account uh, at your passing unless you have the collation clause to speak to that. Okay. Um... Right, Rina asks again, um, can a person claim to be a creditor without proof, uh, a verbal creditor? You know, um, now this is not really my forte that falls more into litigation where verbal uh, um, agreements are recognized, but uh, when the party to that verbal agreement has passed on, then we rely on the written proof of a claim. So if there's no written proof of a claim uh, that the deceased had entered into or, or, or um, with, the, with the creditor as such, then it becomes very difficult to substantiate the basis or the legitimacy of that claim against the deceased estate. So uh, in essence, um, unless there's proof and it boils down to uh, black and white, unless there's written proof of a claim or the beneficiaries were aware of this and acknowledge it, then unfortunately there's not much we can do about that verbal claim as such against the deceased estate. Question also from Rina, besides the attorney's fees, does the executor receive fees? So when you say attorney's fees, um, I'm assuming you referring to the attorney being nominated as an executor in the estate. If that's the instance, then they won in the same fees. Um, uh, if you are referring to a lay person or a family member being nominated as an executor and an attorney acting as an agent to the executor and administering the estate, uh, then yes, there would be fees, but it would be the same executor's fees. So it wouldn't be additional cost. The additional cost to the attorney comes in when there is fixed property to deal with and to transfer. Obviously, the transfer costs pertaining to a fixed property are different and separate fees to executor's fees. Hope that answers your question, Rina. Um, then there's a question from uh, Mate Bojo again. What happens to the expenses or maintenance of the beneficiaries in the eight months while the estate is being wound up? Is the interim funds paid while the estate is in the process of winding up? So we do recognize the fact that there are maintenance needs or there potentially would be maintenance needs uh, for the beneficiaries during the process of administration. Um, all would depend on, um, one can only step into a position of authority to deal with the assets, close bank accounts, receive proceeds from investments and so forth when you have the letter of executorship. So that is the first milestone of the estate to obtain the letter of executorship. The second milestone is to close all of these investments, receive the funds into the state bank account that the executor opens up, um, and then to assess the liquidity in the estate because one cannot advance funds uh, during the process of administration and deplete 
all the funds available before any costs have been paid, for example, for transfer of, of fixed property or finalization of the estate. So, so what we do typically, uh, Mateboche, is we would assess the liquidity in the estate. And if it is reasonable maintenance needs, then yes, we would make it available to the nominated beneficiary. Uh, Renette wants to know if your husband dies and the bond is registered in both names, what happens? Jan, you want to answer that? Sure, sure. Lost, let me just to unmute myself. So it depends if you, the spouse, if you inherit the property, if he left it to you, then um, as Charlotte mentioned earlier on, a um, Substitution of debtor can be done. In other words, you take the bond over and you will then be liable for the bond payments. I see it carries on. You say when your husband dies, there's still tax to be paid by the wife. Uh, that is uh, estate duty. In general, estate duty is payable. Um, everything more than three and a half million rand on the value of the estate is taxed at 20%. However, whatever the spouse inherits, there's no estate duty payable on that. To answer your question, the estate is worth 10 million years, the wife inherits everything. No, there's no estate duty payable. Um, I see we've covered all the questions. Are there anybody that wants to ask questions? Um, just unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Uh, yes, please. I would like to find out if you've got sexual title timeshare, uh, can uh, and you don't want the grandchildren or children to inherit the timeshare because of the cost. Uh, can uh, what do we do in a, a, a case like that? Yeah, it's um, timeshare is always the, a major problem because timeshare. I get the impression people are not interested in it anymore. So you can't just say. Um, you can't just leave it out. You have to deal with it to finalize your estate. So either we have to sell it um, or if, if the children don't want it, um, then we can maybe see if we can even negotiate with the company if they're prepared to take it back. The long and the short is you have to deal with it. You can't just leave it in the air. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Any more questions? Hello, it's Shumani. Yes, Shumani. Uh, I try to send a question, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a BC, so I could not send one, <laughs> uh, born before computers. <laughs> what I wanted to ask was that, can I state how I want to be buried in the, in the, in the, in the, in your world? Thing? Shumani, yeah. yes, you can, you can absolutely do that, but remember, you can even state if you want to be buried, if you want to be um, cremated. But remember, that's a wish, all right? So nobody can be yeah. forced to comply with your wish. Um, I mean, if yeah. you say you want to be buried in the, the um, um, I can't get the word, um, my word, I can't get it now. But anyway, and they do it the other way around, um, then you won't be around to object to that. So that's something I always say to my clients, um, to be cremated, that's the word I was looking for. I say to my clients, uh, discuss these things with your loved ones. Um, and, and if you say you want to be buried in this way and that way, uh, surely they will honor your wishes and that's what will happen. But sure, to answer your question, you can specify it in your will. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Peter, if you're still there, thank you. It's good marketing there for us, but we appreciate it. Peter Thompson. <laughs> right, people, thank you for attending. That will be the end of it. Um, we have recorded this. If anybody wants a copy, then just send us an email to wills at and uh, we will make a plan um, to get it to you. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah.